Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to Colonial Heights. Welcome online. We're glad everybody's here today. In the microphone. Is that better? Everybody's shrugging. Rhonda? I don't know. Any better? Now they complain they can't see me over there. Anyway, welcome to Colonial Heights. We're glad you're all here. Uh, we have Sam still with us. In case you're wondering, uh, the elders have decided to keep Matt on sick leave just to let him continue to recuperate. And Sam is doing a marvelous job for us. And we just want to keep him in the pulpit for a while also. So he's in the bathroom. That's all right. He'll be here when it's time for him to go up. Anyway, welcome. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you again. Such a beautiful day you've given us. And you're so, so marvelous. We just can't bring ourselves to, to express it because our language is inadequate. But thank you for the day. May what we do here be pleasing in your sight. Bless our congregation. Bless those who are online watching now or later. And just accept this for our praise for today. Thank you for Jesus who died for us. And it's through his most precious name we pray. Amen. 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 This is beautiful to see you all here today. Stand and join us as we sing When I Think About You, as we get our hearts and our minds on the Lord today as we're gathered. Amen. I know your love for me when I think about love. I know you set me free when I think about you. I know you'll always be. His praise will always be on my lips. I will glory in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Amen. Amen. Our next song is 10, called 10,000 Reasons. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get it. We'll get it. Hey, see if I see what I'm saying. Found it. 
Oh, 
guess I've had uh, a lot of time to think about past things, just everything that's been going on. And uh, you know, I, 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 I get stronger every day. I feel better every day. One of these days I'll have my focus back, but uh, you know, that'll, that'll come soon enough, I suppose, if I need it. I thought back uh, with a, a scripture that we'll get to in a few minutes about when I first became a Christian. I was 14 years old. Uh, I was a horrible person, a sinner in need of God's grace and mercy and God's help. And I thought about how it took me about a year and a half working on the outside things, my bad language, abusive speech, dirty jokes, um, being very unkind to say the least. And what I realized later was that what was changing was not the outside me, it was the inside me. Because that's the only way that the outside me would change. And one of my, my verses that I've always come back to is out of Matthew chapter 12. If you'd like to turn to that, you're welcome to do so. Uh, this will be a short talk, not a long one. If it was going to be a long one, I'd be sitting on this stool right here. Matthew 12, 33, 34, 35. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good tidings or good things out of the good stored up in him. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. Well, I had stored up plenty of evil, but God and me together worked for my heart to be right with him, for a lot of that poison that was me to be drawn out, replaced. Now, many times it was very painful. Many times it was like, am I still me? Now, did I like the old me? Not really. But I wanted to be that, that good tree and produce good fruit for the Lord. The key phrase here is, the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Now, it's important for us to work with the Lord and let him work in us to change us, to become the people that he wants us to be and that we want us to be in the Lord. Isaiah 26 is the verse that kind of launched my thinking on this. And uh, Isaiah 26, uh, 3 and 4. You will keep him, or you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord, the Lord himself, is the rock eternal. So we want to be steadfast. We want to belong to him. We want to work at that. We want to be the best that we can be for him, to honor him, make him proud that we wear his name. All these things. But it takes day-by-day day effort and letting God be at work in us. When we meet around this table, we are reminded that Jesus, day-by-day, day, every day, lifted up his life to be used by the Father for us and to glorify the name of the Father. As we take these emblems today, we're proclaiming Jesus' death burial and resurrection until he comes again. We're proclaiming that we want to be steadfast in him to bring honor and glory to his name. Father, I thank you for this communion. Thank you, Father, that we can draw near to you. Help us, Father, to be open to your leading. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
I mentioned that I've had a lot of time to think about things. And uh, thinking about things, conversations that my dad and I have had over the years. And my, my, my mom and dad became Christians only uh, less than two months before I did. We went to church. Um, I, I suppose as I was talking about my own life, that you could have called us hypocrites during that time. Or we were distant seekers from the, for the Lord. I, I don't know how you describe us. But we didn't know Jesus. We became Christians um, in 1972. My mom and dad, then myself. In 73, my two sisters and my brother. After that, numerous other family members. When I was 16, I'd been a Christian a couple of years. I got my first paycheck. And I think minimum wage at that time was like $1.20 an hour, if I remember correctly. All I know is I'd work like 20 hours and get a paycheck for $21.22 or something like that. Oh yeah, exciting. I was gonna tell you why I had the job. I was going to tell you it's because I had a girlfriend in New York and I had to pay for long distance phone bills. Anyways, I'm not going to tell you about that part of it. <laughs> I got my first paycheck. And my dad said to me, he said, Matt, that's what he usually called me. If you start giving 10% of your paycheck, you'll never regret it. With that first paycheck, I gave approximately, I don't know that I had to change, but you know, to make it 10% exactly, but I, I started that point to give to God. And what my dad said, that I would never be sorry, is exactly right. When I met Sharon, we were 18 years old. She was already a giver. And there are many, many things that I liked about her immediately and have loved about her since. But we didn't have to make a decision as we got closer together. We were already givers. And as I said, I've never been sorry a day in my life for that because you can't outgive God. Now, the word tithe technically means tenth because that's what Israel was called on to give. And as Dave has pointed out different times, even before there was an Israel, the tithe was a strong concept with worshiping God. The challenge is for each of us to give generously and give sacrificially so that we can honor the Lord and we can build his kingdom. What I read in Isaiah 26 about putting our trust in the Lord, our trust in Him grows when we take Him at His word and when we give. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you've blessed us with. Thank you, Father, that, that we cannot outgive you, but instead that we see blessing upon blessing when we're faithful, because you are more so every day. Thank you, Father, through Jesus we pray. Right, speak into the mic. We told him we'd let him do little things until we let him have the pulpit back for the full service. So, again, when you come up to visit him, don't hug him too hard. Give him room to breathe. Nice to see some of our members that have been back and been ill. Really glad to see you guys. A couple of announcements. If you haven't yet received it, the church directory app is out. I sent everybody their login link. Uh, I am the administrator for that app. If you have an issue with it, please 
come see me or contact me and I'll get you hooked up. And as you're looking through it and you find out that you don't have a picture in it, that's because you didn't provide me with a picture when I asked. So if you want a picture in it, you got to provide me a picture. If any of the data is wrong when you're looking through it, contact me so I can fix the data. Some of you already have, and I fixed it. Okay? Uh, as for the pictorial hard copy directory, we're still working on that because some of those pictures that weren't provided have been collected and we want to add to it before we put it out so that you get all those pictures. All right, we have a sheet of pictures that we're working on printing. Unfortunately, I ran out of blue ink, so gotta wait till I get the blue ink before I can finish the print job. All right, so that's enough for the directory right now. If you need it, or if you want to get it added to your to your phones, and you have a problem, get a hold of me. Homecoming is right around the corner. Invite a friend. Invite some of the old members who are still in the area. Some come back and visit. We miss them. All right. Uh, September eighth. Guest speaker is Tom Scott, Matt's brother. Looking forward to that. For any details about the uh, meal afterwards, see Helen or Betty. I'll throw you in there. <laughs> All right. So we got homecoming. We do have a need of volunteers. It's been flashing up on the screen. Please come see an elder. Let Matt rest for a while. Come see an elder. If you have any talents you'd like to share with the congregation, we do have a need. We have some openings that we dearly need to have filled. Also, there's going to be some holes in our next uh, food pantry with volunteers. So definitely, that's a time to come out and fill out that volunteer for the food pantry close by the day. Anything else? Short list. I know Matt always has a lot of other things, but that's our short list. The Bible studies are still there. But we'll have a new Defending the Faith class starting up in September. New teacher. We like to rotate them. Anything else? Well, okay then. Uh, children's Church and teachers. You guys are dismissed. Enjoy. Uh, Mike, I think it's prayer time. Sometimes it's so much prayer that needs to be done that we're kind of like, where do we start? Well, I'm going to suggest that you don't pick up the prayer list. It's always in the back. The ladies add to it every week. It's more to pray along with your prayers. There's never enough praying being done. So if you need some suggestions or help, check out those resources. Some of the prayers that are on our list, if you haven't seen it, continue prayers for Matt and his family. And these individual prayers from some people, Megan, like Lisa, wants to pray for Lisa, she has cancer. David Allen are on the list for their daughter, Lynn. She's in the hospital. Sam's on here, he's got his son-in-law who's been in a bad accident, that's the prayers for him and their families. And if they like, they have to be a baby soon, pray for them, the baby, a radio program, like pray for our nation, our leaders, of course, our families, the community. There's a lot to pray for. We beg you guys in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to you, Father, for your gift of the Holy Spirit. The death of your son and our salvation is only made possible through love. This second place of your mercy. 
Help us, Father, to invite God into our hearts. To invite God and Jesus into our church. Help us, Father, to seek the Lord first. And that your, your will, God's will, will be done. Help us to mentor each other, to love each other, to love our community, Father. Help us today with everything. We ask this in the name of your Jesus. Amen. Morning. Good to see everybody. Also, it's great to see some familiar faces from the past. It's like old times. Uh, if you would turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. The sermon today is going to be uh, coming from the Ten Commandments. Let's open with a word of prayer first as you bow your heads. Father God, Yahweh, we just lift up your name, we magnify you, we praise you and worship you. We give you the honor and the glory that you deserve, Father. We are so grateful for your amazing, wonderful love for us, Lord. And we thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of redemption that came through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Father, we thank you for your word which is truth, the real truth, Lord, in this world today, which leads us and guides us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. You give us understanding. Lord, we just pray that your spirit would be amongst us today, Lord, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the understanding of your word as we study it, Father. I pray that lives will be touched today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. In a Gallup poll, from May 2019, 77% of Americans say U.S. moral values are not good and getting worse. There are those, however, who believe the moral state of America is good. For example, 79% believe that divorce is acceptable. 68% believe gambling is okay. 73% believe there's nothing wrong with sex outside of marriage. 67% believe it's okay to have a baby outside of marriage. Homosexual relationships are up 69%. 62% of U.S. adults said the practice of abortion should be legal in all or most cases. The CDC and the Guttmacher Institute reported that there were 930,160 abortions in the United States in 2021. And in all, that's in all 50 states. Compared to 916,460 in 2019. These are just a sample of the moral issues that are facing our nation today and the world. Why has the morality of our nation become so bad? Many today believe there is no moral consensus at all. Actually, that's not true. The moral consensus is that everybody wants to make up their own personal code of ethics and morality, their own Ten Commandments. Moral relativism is rampant. People today say they are free to make up their own rules. But their rules often conflict, their rules often conflict and violate God's law. The sad part of all of this is that even in the church today, many do not even know the Ten Commandments, and morality in the church has also become very lax. Someone recently said that religion is gaining ground, but morality is losing ground. Morality can be compared to a compass. A compass is a device that shows the cardinal directions, north, east, south, west, used for navigation and geographic orientation. It commonly consists of a magnetized needle. The magnetic compass is the most familiar compass type, and it functions as a pointer to magnetic north. But there is also a true north, 
and that is the geographic North Pole. While magnetic north is the direction the compass needle points, often depending on the Earth's rotation or position, true north never changes. Unfortunately, there are things that can interfere with the compass ability to work properly and get you off course. For example, magnetic fields from objects made of metal or other magnetic materials can interfere with the compass's magnetic field. Since the magnetic compasses uh, detect the Earth's magnetic field, other objects in the Earth with magnetic fields can also offset the compass. If you hold a compass improperly, it can also give you an inaccurate reading. Similarly, the inappropriate handling of God's word can also get you off course. As humans, our moral compass can often get off course. For example, if it is not pointing to true north, to God, his laws, to Jesus, to the gospel. If we choose to follow the magnetic north, which changes over time, meaning we compromise our beliefs in favor of what the more popular trend is. The truth of God's word may be altered or distorted or because of ego, greed, power, fear, or rationalization, we refuse to accept God's recommended course and we choose to follow our own course. The Bible is the Christian's ultimate source for the knowledge and wisdom of God and is our moral compass. 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16. Our connection to God provides us with the moral compass and the objective standards we need to live a life that is pointed in the right direction and keeps us on the right path. Proverbs 14, 12 says that there is a way that appears right to a man, but the end thereof is death. In 2 Timothy 4, Paul prophesied concerning the end times, telling Timothy, For the time will come when people will no longer put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to satisfy their itching ears what they want to hear. They will turn their ears from the truth and aside from myths, and aside to myths, excuse me. In many of our churches today, there are some pastors who no longer preach the gospel of truth from the pulpit. They have surrendered to the prevailing culture. Some people no longer desire to hear the truth. Unbelievers no longer tolerate the presence of God's law in our society. And even believers in the church whose faith is superficial have become intolerant of God's law and commandments. God's word has become compromised and stripped of its clear and precise meaning. In the last 10 years across the United States, pastors have been targeted by city officials to turn in their sermons for review because the pastors had chosen to preach against the ungodliness of their city and the country. The word sound in the Greek means healthy. Some of what is being preached in churches today is not healthy, sound doctrine. But for those pastors and ministers who do preach sound doctrine, Paul tells Timothy that in the last days, the church will face increasing resistance to doctrine that is spiritually healthy and nurturing. Pastor Billy Graham once commented, statements by Protestant clergymen condoning sexual immorality have given a new license to people everywhere. Many church leaders now advocate the so-called new morality. Jack Cottrell, Christian author, scholar, and professor states, radical theologians and advocates of the new morality keep telling us that the human race has come of age, meaning that it, is a, it has reached a level of moral maturity and rationalization that should enable it to live without God's law or without laws in general. 
What they propose is a standard in which the ultimate criteria for right and wrong are not the commandments of God, but an individual's subjective perception of what is good for them and for their neighbor. Over time, the consensus on key moral issues and principles has waned, and the younger generation is now embracing this new moral landscape. For example, many believe that what is morally right and wrong changes over time based on the society that they live in, and that each individual determines his or her own moral, that they are their own moral authority. But again, as Billy Graham once said, this is not a new morality, this is the same old immorality. There's a song that I love to hear that states, we have turned the page for a new day has dawned. We've rearranged what is right and what's wrong. Somehow we have drifted so far from the truth that we cannot get back. Where are the virtues that once gave us light? Where are the morals that once governed our lives? Someday we will all awake and look back to find what we have lost. We need to get back to the basics of life, a heart that is pure and a love that is blind and a faith that is fervently grounded in Christ. As a nation that was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and the law of God, we need to get back to the basics of God's law and resume teaching God's law to our children in the public and private schools, in Sunday school, and in our homes. To raise up a generation that is grounded and built upon God's holy law and ready to defend its principles no matter the cost. As Christians, we must uphold the sanctity and the validity of God's law. So in our lesson today, we, we can sum up the Ten Commandments into basically two commandments concerning the law. Number one, those commandments that pertain to our relationship with God, with Yahweh. And number two, those commands that pertain to our relationship with each other, with our friends, and with our neighbors. So let's look at the text today. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me but showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which your Lord, which the Lord gave which the Lord your God gives you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs. To your neighbor. Amen. Praise God. So number one, those commands that pertain to our relationship with God. 
Exodus 20, 1 through 2. Then God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You know, the Israelites had been in the land of Egypt for over 400 years, most of those years as slaves to the Egyptians. God is reminding the Israelites that he is the one who brought them out of bondage to the Egyptians, out of a life of slavery and despair. He is the one who redeemed them and gave them their freedom and salvation. When God uses the word out, I brought you out, he is saying that I am the one who has liberated you from your bondage and slavery. Victor Hamilton, an Old Testament professor and scholar states, what gives the commandments their authority is not so much the content of what is being said, but who is saying it. Why? Because the commandments represent the very character and attributes in the heart of God. This is the reason why God can now impose his commandments and requirements on the Israelites. Because he is their redeemer and he wants to form in them his holy character. In our world today, there is a spirit of lawlessness and disobedience to God that's been around since the beginning of man's existence on this earth. It is progressively worsening. It is escalating in its presence and its severity, infiltrating every aspect of humanity, our lives. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. In Matthew 24, 37, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. And what were the days of Noah like? Well, if we read Genesis 6, 5, it states, God saw the wickedness of man. Hang on one second. <laughs> God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was always evil continually. This new morality is no morality at all, but immorality. And it threatens the very security and existence of all humanity. Nearly every nation in the past fell because of immorality and corruption. And the most disturbing fact about it is that even the church today has become so callous and tolerant of these things that we no longer are appalled at what is happening. We see the immorality around us every day. We see our nation moving farther and farther away from God's law and the truth of his word. Lord, I pray that the church would go back to preaching God's word of truth with boldness and without fear and quit watering down the gospel. I pray that our schools and our government would repent and turn back to God and reinstate prayer in the schools and teach the Ten Commandments to our young people. But who is to blame for this deteriorating moral situation? It's not the young people. Everybody's blaming the young people, but it's not the young people. It is the older generations. It is those of us who have failed to stand up for God's laws and commandments, who have failed to stand up for what is right and to keep the schools, keep prayer in the schools and keep preaching and teaching God's laws to our young people. Recently on national news, it was reported that some schools in some schools, the students are allowed to have a satanic after-school club. But yet, when students approach them about having an after-school Bible club, they were rejected. And they call it separation of church and state. We have become a morally destitute and corrupt nation, and it's getting worse. What we are witnessing is an unprecedented attack upon God's laws, his standards of righteousness, and upon Christianity as a whole. I spoke of this, and I'm sure Matt has and others. We have seen this coming for the last 40 years. And it's only going to get worse. What we are witnessing now is, number one, prophecy being fulfilled, being in the last days. Number two, we are witnessing the steady decline in morality of this nation and its subsequent demise. 
In 2 Timothy 3, the Apostle Paul states, In the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, greedy, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, haters of good, treacherous, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. This is certainly a depiction of the days we are living in, is it not? So how should God's redeemed people live? Well, let's take a look at the Ten Commandments, where our moral compass should be pointing to see how we are to live in God's presence. The Hebrew term here is dabar, which means word. Most Bible translations render the phrase as either the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. They are in fact called the words of the covenant. They were written by the finger of God himself, Exodus 31, 18. So number one, you shall have no other gods before me. God is supreme and sovereign, and as such should be the only controlling factor in our life. Our faith in God and our relationship with God should govern every decision that we make. Why? Because he is the one true and only God. And because he is the redeemer of all mankind. He redeemed us from sin and death through the death of his son Jesus. Whether people want to accept the truth about God and what he accomplished through his son Jesus or not, does not take away from the fact that he is God, he is the creator, and he is the redeemer of all mankind. And we owe our allegiance to him. He is our ultimate authority. Therefore, he is worthy of all glory, worship, honor, and praise. Matt, you mentioned earlier about the, uh, the minimum wage. You know, you and I are only a year apart, so I, I remember that. And you'll probably remember this, too. Uh, back in the late 1970s, early uh, 80s, uh, there was a uh, popular uh, songwriter, Bob Dylan, uh, and he wrote a song. He became a Christian around that time. And he wrote a song that says, you got to serve somebody. Dave probably remembers this too. He says, you're either going to serve the devil or you're going to serve the Lord. But you got to serve somebody. There's no in-between. There's no other options. It's either Satan, the prince of this world, or it's God. you got to serve somebody. We must choose who we are going to trust and believe in and who we are going to serve. There are two types of idolatry, religious and secular. The religious type of idolatry is worshiping other gods. Jack Cottrell says, what God is commanding is we must not have any other deity except him, besides him, or in place of him. And then there's secular type. This happens when something or activity becomes number one in your life. It supersedes your relationship with God. For example, it can be a job, it can be your family, it can be a hobby, alcohol, drugs, it all takes precedence over your relationship with God. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. This commandment deals with making images that represent the true God. In other words, we are not to create any images intended to portray God. God is a spirit. He is an uncreated being, completely unique apart from his creation. No one has seen God at any time except Jesus, the Son of God. In Exodus 32, Moses had been on Mount Sinai for quite some time with, uh, with God. And uh, the people said, well, he must be dead or something's happened to him. He's not coming back down. And so they got together all their gold. And they had Aaron uh, uh, heat it all up and make a, uh, a golden calf. And Aaron said, this is a visible representation of your God who brought you out of Egypt. It dishonored God. It obscures his glory. And it brings the creator down to the corruptible creation. 
It puts limitations on an infinite, eternal God. Number three, you shall not take the name of the Lord God, your God, in vain. The basic principle underlying this commandment is the majesty and the holiness of God's name. The word holy means separated, distinct, set apart. In Exodus 15, Moses says, Who is like you among the gods, O Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? In Isaiah 6, 3, and also in Revelation 4, 8, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Lord God Almighty. He is worthy of our honor and respect. Finally, to use God's name in vain means to use God's name in a useless or fraudulent way. Examples of using God's name in a meaningless, worthless, purposeless, profane, irreverent, and deceitful way. Do not swear by God's name and do not use God's name as a curse word. Number four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall work, but the seventh day is the Lord your God. This commandment is rarely, if ever, observed correctly anymore. And I'm guilty of this as well. This was Israel's special day to honor God and enjoy the blessings of God with their family. This is also the New Testament Christian's special day. Now the days are a little different, but it's still the Christian's special day. It most, it most likely comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which means to rest from labor. This law is as, is as important as the first three. Why? Because on this day we honor God by obeying Him and worshiping Him, honoring Him. It is the Lord's day. Instead of focusing our minds on other worldly things, we should be focusing our attention on God, the blessings of God our prosperity, our salvation, and eternal life. By doing so, we are blessing the Lord and acknowledging that He is sovereign in our lives. Next, the commands that pertain to our relationship with others. Number five, honor your father and your mother. In my opinion, and this is shared by many Christian scholars, professors, ministers, the failure to obey this command has probably caused as much or more damage to our relationship with God and others than any other commandment. Why? Because this is foundational. It's at the very core of our relationship with God and others. God established the family unit as one of the most critical and important elements of our society. Failure to educate our children about God, His laws, his love has led to a multi-generational disregard and disbelief in God and the rapid moral decay of our family units. God gave parents the authority over the family to declare and enforce his law and what shall be considered right and wrong. It was their responsibility to teach their children about God and His law and to discipline them when they broke the law. Number six, you shall not murder. God is the giver and taker of life. He forbids the taking of innocent life. Let me say that again. He forbids the taking of innocent life. Matthew 5, 21 through 22, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to people long ago, You shall not murder. Anyone, anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or a sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, Raka, the interpretation for that means you're saying to that person, you are worthless, you are useless, you have no value, you're a good for nothing, you're stupid. It's character assassination, and that's what we are not to do. The basic principle here is the sanctity of human life. 
God alone is the giver and taker of life. No one else has that authority, period. We were created in the image and likeness of God. We are unique from all other forms of his creation. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Marriage was designed by God. God ordained and blessed the marriage. It is a holy union sanctified by God. The man and wife are to complement and complete each other. They become one life together. It's an exclusive relationship between one man and one woman. It is patterned after the relationship God has with his chosen people. And you can see this in 2 Corinthians and Ephesians. It is a covenantal relationship, patterned after God's covenantal relationship with his chosen people, his church. Number eight, you shall not steal. I don't think I have to elaborate on that. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You are to tell the truth. You are not to lie. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. And then number 10, you shall not covet. In Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2, Moses writes, these are the commands, the decrees, the laws, the Lord your God has directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing into when you cross over the Jordan, so that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands. God was telling the Israelites through Moses that if they kept his commandments and feared him, it would mean a long, healthy, happy, prosperous life. In 1 Timothy, Paul states, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. We know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing that the law was not made for the righteous but for the lawless and the rebellious. God told the Israelites to tell the story of their redemption of, by God to their children and all generations that follow. In Deuteronomy 6, 2024, the only way that they could understand the purpose of the law was to understand the context of the law, which was the experience of the Exodus, their story of salvation, God's redemption for them. The relationship between the law and the gospel is crucial for everyone on this earth. Why? Because God sent Jesus to redeem all humanity from the bondage of sin and death. The law reveals our sin and the need for a savior. Paul, the apostle said, I would, have, I would not have known what sin was had the law said, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie. And it's through Jesus' death and resurrection that the exodus and the emancipation from sin and death becomes a reality for all humanity. While the law is valid, the law does not solve our problem of sin. The law is like a mirror. When you look into a mirror, you see your hair may be disheveled a little bit, needs to be combed, your face may be dirty, needs to be washed clean. The mirror, the law, reveals what is wrong and needs to be made right. Now the mirror cannot wash your face, nor can the law save us. The law cannot save you. It merely points out what is not right in your life. That's how the law works. That's how the gospel works in our lives. It reveals what is wrong in our lives and what needs to be fixed. The problem is we cannot fix what is wrong in ourselves. We are powerless. The flesh is too weak. Our righteousness is like uh, filthy rags to the Lord. We do not have the power within us to obey God's commandments. We cannot satisfy the demands of a perfect and holy God. Augustine said the usefulness of the law lies in convicting a man of his infirmity, moving him to call upon the remedy of grace in Christ Jesus. 
Charles Spurgeon said, as a sharp needle prepares the way for the thread, so the piercing law makes a way for the bright silver thread of divine grace. Scripture, God's word, the gospel, is the source of our saving faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The truth of the word mixed with faith in Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit, leads to spiritual life. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The law convinces and convicts us of our sin, and through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, tells us we need a Savior. And then we come to, to Christ, confessing our sins, and through water baptism, we receive redemption, the gift of salvation, and the Holy Spirit in our lives. Today as we close, if anyone has a special need this morning, needs prayer, if anybody needs to come to Christ in baptism, we are here for you. Um, so let's stand as we have a word of prayer. Father God, Yahweh, Lord, again, we just acknowledge you as the one true living God. Lord, there is no God but you. There is no other God who's redeemed humanity. There's no other God who understands our need for a Savior. You sent your son Jesus who, who took on human flesh and he suffered and he experienced everything that we do, Lord. And yet he was without sin. He was victorious. He satisfied all the requirements of the law. He was the pure blood sacrifice, holy sacrifice for our sins, Lord. God, we need you, Lord. We need you in our lives. We need a Savior. We need salvation. And Father, I just thank you for your word, which is truth. Lord, give us boldness. Help us to stand up for what is right in these last days, Lord. Not to fear man, what man can do to us. Lord, fill us with your spirit and with your power, Lord. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. She said, I needed to hold the mic closer. Yeah, you heard me? It's just you. It's just you. Yeah. It's going to start to like it. Yeah, I had a question. I'm sorry. What did you say? I didn't hear it. No? No. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, fine. Okay. Okay, good. She's I actually good. turned my hearing aids down. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Very good. Um, I signed up for Stir Fry to bring. Home coming on. Yeah, I either signed up for the I'm not sure. I really couldn't answer that. What's that? It's not the home coming. Yeah. It's in the Sunday integration. Children's church. Yeah. I was just asking if you need to. Yeah, I don't know. It gets lost.
Surprise to you. I know she came in. I said, I'm waiting. I said, I'm waiting. I love that. Oh, we do this twice. Oh my God, your sugar helps you feel better. Yeah. We're going to take you a lot. I said, This is your last year. I'm sorry. That's what, that's what I'm telling people. Me too. Oh, no, very good. Very good. We'll have to go out to lunch or something and yes. celebrate. I bet you approach it from a different viewpoint. It is different. How many years do you have? 28 in the school system, but I was an assistant for part of that time. So is this the 30th year? No, this is the 28th, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not going to hang in there till 30. I'm good at 28. <laughs> She's talking about, this is actually 31 for me. Oh, wow. I awesome. tease him. He retired too. Like, I was going to, I, well, I retired last year. Well, he made that. He retired. So, one more. I'll go. I'll get him. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You can keep the solicitor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, until you're 65. It'll be 65. Yeah, we'll be 67 next summer. So it's like, that was a good. Oh, that's good. That was a good cut off. Okay. Was that tricky to get? Like, no, we have uh, a friend who's actually in the accepted uh, school system. Yes. Yeah. Who also works with Medicaid. He's oh, I, we got to get a hold of that. Yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah we can. His name is Please. Dan White, and um, he's certified uh, Medicare. Awesome. So he sits down and sits Oh, yeah, I definitely want his we'll, name, please. We'll yeah. he's, he's a smart guy. Good. And we're also going to call him over questions. Yeah, we call him over questions. Good call. Good call up there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But see, you're already on this. I'll be 65 in the February. Still on school insurance, so i got to get part A. Did you do that? No, I don't think so. Because they say you sign up for part A. Mm. I don't know, we did a consultation with our insurance company. Yeah. Yeah, I went with the, uh, they, they have different, as you know, they have different plans. And I went with the Sierra plan. Because I had made this in care for so many yeah. years. But yeah, I went with the set of Sierra Medicare. That's what my car looks like. It yeah. doesn't really have that. Yeah. 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 So. Which covers Part B and that's the and which one, yeah. what do they call that plus or the bundle? Yeah, the bundle. The yeah. bundle. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. I know we've been developing this all about this. And we need to need it. Well a friend of mine, she said she started calling in January, she was gonna retire from teaching. Finally talked to a person in May or something and she said, Start making those calls soon. So if you know somebody that's got maybe it was social security and not that. That sounds more like social security because they did that. 
Med Medicare, they were doing it right on. I mean, we were getting all kinds of advertisements from them, all these different people. Well, I see those kind of trying to get you to go through that. Yeah. Yeah. 